You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. The passage I plan to look at with you is divided up differently. There's not a lot of agreement about where to begin the passage we're going to look at. In traditional Jewish editions of the Bible, the pericope runs from verse 21 to the end of the chapter, while the NRSV starts at verse 19 and runs to the end, and the NIV has several smaller sections. Well, that, I think the verses that I've chosen form a sensible unit because they speak of creation and destruction, whilst the ones on either side speak of foolish unwillingness to listen and of war. But it is clear that the verses we're looking at do form part of a wider unit, and you should really look at that. This difficulty in describing the exact boundaries of the passage we're looking at is typical of prophetic books. Even in the book of Amos, in which the speech units are usually pretty clear, there are times when these units are moulded together into coherent wholes, as I've argued in academic articles on Amos 3 and on Amos 7, or at least uh, 7 1 through to uh, 8 3. And the other prophetic books often blend the units so that the boundaries blur and they compose longer speeches, or maybe they were composed as longer speeches. But for our purposes, I think the unit we've chosen works quite nicely. I've chosen to translate it myself because I wanted to stress a number of things. In particular, I wanted to stress the repetition of C, which doesn't come out in most English translations, and the almost staccato feel to it, because I think that contributes to the to the overall emotional and rhetorical force of the unit. So, Jeremiah 4, 23-27, in the temporary English version, as my son called it once. I looked at the earth. See, it's higgledy-piggledy to heaven, but no light there. I looked on the mountains. See, they're quaking. All the hills shake themselves. I looked. See, no human. All the birds of heaven have fled. I looked. See, the fields are desert, and all its cities are destroyed before Yahweh, before the heat of his anger. For thus says Yahweh, all the land will be desolation. But I will not make a full ending. Because of this the earth will mourn, and the heavens will be dark above, because I have spoken. I have decided, and I have not relented, nor will I turn back. Now, it's not a cheerful piece, is it? But it is a powerful and dramatic piece. One of the reasons for making a very literal translation, aside from wanting you to notice the repetition of that call to, to notice, see, was I wanted you to notice, too, how many echoes there are in this passage of the creation story in Genesis 1. Among the words and phrases that I noticed were earth and heavens, and the phrase I translated higgledy-piggledy, thohu va vohu, in the King James without form and void, light, man, birds of heaven, and there are more. In addition to all of these words or phrases, there's language that talks of mountains and hills, which, though it doesn't directly echo Genesis 1, does cause us to think of creation. But what's the effect here of all this talk of creation? For there is no light. The earth and the hills quake and shake. Living in New Zealand, not a fortnight after the terrible earthquake in Christchurch, brings that quaking and shaking home. The field becomes a desert. Desolation, mourning, and darkness reinforce this feel. Something strange is going on here. The way I put it to my students is that this section is a sort of negative hymn. As a hymn tells of human joy in God's creative and redemptive acts, these verses mourn divine destructiveness. Before the passage that we're focusing on, there was talk of war and God interjected himself. But here it's more a cosmic undoing of creation that's in view, before towards the end of the chapter returning to warfare. The theology of this piece is clear. God is creator, the maker of the world and its inhabitants. But this fact means that one day in sadness God might undo what's been made. For the possibility of uncreation is implied in the claim that there is a creator. And Jeremiah, like the other prophets, warns that this might be God's last resort. 
The New Testament, of course, proposes another last resort. The Creator becomes creature, and submits to the worst that creatures can inflict, shares their fate. Through this submission, God makes possible a new creation, and a partnership with a renewed humanity. And I'll just notice that some of that thought might already be implicit in Jeremiah's later vision of the new covenant in 31-31 following. <laughs>